Hi everyone and welcome back to the show. So this week I'm honoured to be joined by Ashley Costello. She's a psychotherapist, a TEDx speaker and Ashley teaches all about raising resilient children. So today she's going to be talking to us about future-proofing our kids, something we all need to learn about. Ashley, a massively warm welcome to the show. Thanks, Lucy, and thanks for inviting me on. I'm really excited about today. Oh, it's a pleasure. So Ashley, to get started, I'd love for you to share with us just a little bit about your journey into this being your profession, all about raising resilient children. Like, How did you get into this? Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me, it's funny, isn't it? Because I think when you talk to a lot of teens, they don't really know what they want to do. And from being about 14, I always wanted to go into psychology. I wasn't really sure what it was. I just knew it was kind of the study of the mind. And I was like, oh, yeah, I quite like the idea of that. It was a bit different, you know. Um, and then when I was 16, my dad had a nervous breakdown. My sister's 10 years younger than me, so she was only six. So she was kind of packed off to my nana's and my mum was left to pick up the pieces. And it's actually really difficult because there was no support for the family. Like it was like, yes, he's really struggling here. We'll get him some help. You know, we'll get medication, whatever. Um, And it was just brought on by stress. It was a complete um, kind of overload and a chemical imbalance brought on by stress. So it was something that was fixable. It was going to take quite a bit of time. We would have old dad back, you know, eventually. And, but we were left a little bit like, oh my God, like what has happened? It came completely out of the blue. Now, my sister at that time, because she was at Manana, she kind of didn't really understand anything. We didn't really share anything with her. But then it happened again, a good few years later. Um, I was 24. I was a psychology graduate, I was a psychotherapist, and it, I remember the day, clear as a bell, I literally said to my mom in the morning, dad's not well, and she said, oh, thank goodness, and we went to church. Now, we were, my mom was brought up really heavily Catholic, and we were brought up in church schools, but my mum was very around, you know, you ask questions around everything. She was a very curious kind of person. Yeah. So we weren't like really heavily religious, but that day we both felt like this spiritual, we're going to need this. So we both went to church in the morning and we came home and we kind of hankered down because we knew what was coming. And we... I rang the doctor, I rang, I knew who to ring, I knew where we were going to get help, what the next stages were. We sat my sister down, who by this point is 14, so she's a teen, she knows what's going on. And everything was done so smoothly, so easily, and yeah, and he was right in half of the time, like literally half of the time, he was he was wow. back better. And so it was one of those moments where you think, that's what I did this for. That's Mm. why this came to fruition. And one of the big things for me is as I was training and as I was, um, you know, looking at different paths to do, I always thought I'm going to be an educational psychologist. Now, Mm -hmm. a lot of educational psychologists will spend a lot of time in schools or they'll do a lot of assessments and things like that. And I started to go down that path and I thought, oh, okay, so I'm going to get an hour with this child and that's it. And my job is literally playing with kids most of the day, like not always playing, but, and I just thought I can't do that because I will not have that face-to-face interaction with kids. And so, Mm. um, yeah, so I thought, right, okay, I'm going to do this and, um, did therapy kind of trained in therapy and then specialized in young people. And I was just very, very lucky that, um, I had really, really good experiences here and abroad. We lived abroad for a few years. So I had lots and lots of experience with everyone from two right up to 80, to be honest. But um, right, wow. you know, I do I do the majority between kind of primary, secondary and uh, uni students. And yeah, it's just, it's been a blessing. They keep me on my toes and I love it. Yeah. And it's, it's a really lovely job to have. I bet, and I, I imagine as well, it's an ever evolving thing as we live in an age now with complications or I suppose 
additional things to consider with tech that wasn't around you know even a decade ago it wasn't what it is today and and we're raising children in like a, with a whole different world and it's continually evolving um I'm sure well I'm sure we'll get to that and I'm sure that's part of part of the work that you do is like everything's changing and the way their minds um are developing must be must be different I, I don't know I'm not the expert but I'm assuming it must be different than it was no. You're absolutely right. And and I'm a massive advocate for technology. And I think we should mm. use it more in schools. You know, a lot of people mm. are crying out and saying less. And I think we should use it more so that it frees us up to learn in a different way, to be more curious. Mm. So one of my things, and, and I think you mentioned it at the beginning, um, in my TEDx talk, and that's where the name The Resilient Kid came from, really, was yeah. I said a line about, you know, we should be teaching kids to fail, we should be teaching them to be resilient, things like that. But there's there's a part in it that I say, you know, if I asked you, Lucy, the Battle of Hastings, you could probably give me what year that was, because we, you know, we were drummed into us at school. Yeah. Um, and we don't need that now because, you know, when when we were at school, we couldn't just look up on, you know, one of the platforms. We couldn't just go to a search engine. We can mm. do that now and get the same information in kind of 0.5 seconds. Why are we mm -hmm. getting the kids to learn by rote? So mm. the big thing for me is let's learn, let's use technology mm -hmm. so that we can look up information, but that we learn in a more curious way. And um, yeah, and really extend that to not just learning about topics, but learning about ourselves, learning about our mm -hmm. brain, you know, things yeah. like that. So technology for me is, it's a real, I think a lot of the parents that I speak to um, talk about being held kind of by hostage by tech, mm -hmm. whereas yeah. it would to be. You know, and I think the biggest thing without kind of obviously going down that minefield of tech, I think one of the biggest things my advice to parents is when you were growing up, you probably, you know, you might have had a computer. Uh, you may have had a mobile phone, but maybe not till later. Children now have grown up with these things, even if they didn't get a phone till they went to secondary school. The minute they sat on your lap, they had your phone, they had an iPad, you know, they had access to laptops, all that kind of thing. And actually, we need to teach them to be responsible. And I think I get a lot of parents, especially teen parents who will say to me, yeah, but they're in high school now. How can I take the phone off them? Well, it's not their phone. Unless they're paying for it, it's not their phone. It's your phone. And I have a very mm. understanding with mine where I'll say to them, I've I've noticed your screen time. What can we do about it? And they'll go, I'm sorry, right, I'll get it back down. You know, things like that. So it's about teaching children mm -hmm. responsibility for mm -hmm. an item that they don't know the world without. We mm -hmm. do. Mm. That's really valid. Like, I love the way you've put that so eloquently and simply, really. Um, yeah, it's not ever... I've just realised I've just gained two iPhone 15s. <laughs> <Yay. laughs> Brilliant. But yeah, it's um it's so true that it yeah, we're we're almost gifting them with these assets that they can use to their advantage, to their great advantage. Mm -hmm. But with that comes great responsibility. And I, I think that's really a worthwhile thing to think about with parents who are wondering, I, I have parents all the time asking, oh, I don't know when to let them have a phone and they're reluctant, but they know they're gonna have to. And it's like, well, actually, maybe the answer is when they are uh, of an age and a, a, a maturity that they can be responsible for not only looking after it because they're expensive devices but also for managing the usage on on that so that's a really um yeah I really like how simply you've put that <laughs> well, if somebody would have said to me here's here's a here's a gadget that is worth mm. what, nowadays 700 pound minimum yeah so here's a gadget yeah. worth 700 pound and I'm going to pay for your usage of that every month um but actually what I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to not scroll right and I want to limit certain apps until you're a certain age and actually you know when you get in bed at night there is no there is no scrolling you're not allowed to do that but mm. do you want it or don't you and the answer is of course I do 
Okay, yeah. so these are the consequences. This is what happens. Yeah. Now, I very rarely have to take the phone off my um, children, but I think you've mm -hmm. picked up a really valid point there, Lucy, about when they are old enough to be responsible. So I'll give you an example. Um, my youngest is 14 now, and mm -hmm. I never let him have... So he got his first console. He had a Switch, but he never had mm -hmm. a, you know, a PlayStation or any of them until he was 13. And mm -hmm. it was a complete surprise. I didn't think he was getting one because we'd always said, you know, not, not, um, no, you're not having one. You've got a switch, you've got a phone, you don't need anything else. And it was because we knew in our head when we gauged that he'd be responsible enough, we'd get him one. Yeah. So for his 13th yeah. birthday, this is what he's got. And then he says, Oh, can I have Fortnite? And I went, No. And he was like, Oh, why? So I just literally went, ABC, no. And in summer last year, he came up with this whole PowerPoint presentation <laughs> of the pros, the cons, and what he could do about the cons. And I said, okay. And it was stuff like, um, you know, you're going to get, you, you're going to use it too much. You're going to be drawn into the game. It's about fighting, blah, blah, blah. And he gave me counterpoints to every single argument I had. And so I sat there and part of me thought, wow, I really admire you. You are now a responsible young guy. You've thought about this. You've put time and effort into it. I admire that. And the other part of me thought, mm. damn, I'm going to have to give in. And I did. You know, <laughs> we, I said, do this for your dad. Let's see what he says. I don't want to be the only one making this. And we both said, both agreed. And he got it. And there is times when... You know, we might have to say, okay, mate, it's time. And he'll go, right, okay. Because he knows that mm. it is it is a responsibility. And if mm. he doesn't take that seriously, then he won't have that game. That's a choice he makes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, I think it is about them understanding the consequences of using too much tech. Whatever and that is. actually, him putting that in a presentation with these counter arguments, which is brilliant, by the way, and he's used tech for good in d doing yeah. that, but he's obviously then thought about those negatives and even just to come up with a counter argument for it still takes the consideration he's got to digest that, um, which, I, yeah, to, to some extent that in itself is a... Um, uh, demonstration of his understanding of the harm that these things can do. Um, Fortnite is a battle in in my home. My eldest is thirteen and a half, so I can relate. Um, and I I imagine you're well like aware of the, from this the psychotherapist um, expertise of how they make those things so like more 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 like if you if you come out you're going to be letting your friends down on if you. Um, oh, there's just always another thing or another event or another thing that in somehow where you can earn money or rankings and it's the to keep you going, like an addiction. And it, Oh, it, 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 it absolutely is, Lucy. I cannot, yeah. I mean, without this being, this whole talk being about tech. Yeah, because it could be. <laughs> yeah, it totally could be. But if we look at, I mean, I have got nothing but admiration for the likes of these software developers like Instagram, like, you know, the, the games mm. like Fortnite, because they have not just gone, let's make it shiny, let's make it this. They've gone away to neuroscience. They've looked at the yeah. risk, what draws people back. Now, the, the whole thing of these and, and why they've exploded so much really is because of COVID. But the what draws us together as human beings is connection. Is yeah. And if you, yeah. you know, that's why people die of loneliness. And yeah. so if you think we're, we're going to ask you to buy this game and, and Fortnite are very clever because you don't even actually buy the game, do they? No. But, you know, we're going to ask you to do this. Then we're going to ask you to connect to your buddy. So you're already marketing for them. And yeah. then what we're going to do is we're going to award you with various different events or rankings mm. or things. So you've already got that. And then we're going to throw celebrities in the mix. Now yeah. these celebrities usually just lend their brand. They don't even, they're not even involved in it. Um, you know, so you can see, and that's like touching celebrity, isn't it? So how amazing mm -hmm. is that? Um, you know, you've got Instagram and what they do is, so say you posted up today and you put a post on and you got a hundred likes. Instagram hold back 
like 80 likes. So you see 20 and you think, oh, I thought it'd be more popular than that. And then they let a few trickle through because then you'll check it again and you'll check it again and you'll check it again. So it's very addictive, very, very clever the way they do it. Um, and that's why we've got to teach our kids responsibility. That's so and true. I had no idea. Teach them about the future. You know, we've got to teach them about tech, not just say ban it, not just say, well, they shouldn't have it. We've got to teach them that this is how they operate. This is how it works. Go into that open knowing, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, makes a whole mm-hmm. difference, I think. It's not going away, is it? It's something yeah. we have to get comfortable with and, and work with, not against. And yeah, yeah. that's I've always said that. And it's um it's not easy. And lots of parents will be listening to this who, you know, are navigating um well tech being part of it but for the first time in a in a no parent has gone before us and done this you know we're the first generation um and so it's not easy and I think you know coming back to raising resilient children future proofing them your your whole expertise is built on this um yeah tell us a bit about you know the 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 foundations of that the foundations of raising resilient children so it's really, it's really funny because you hear, especially in our circles, you know, in entrepreneurial circles, we hear resilience all the time. And to, to the point that I'm bored of it and I'm, you know, my company is called The Resilient Kid. And actually, so I started because I'm um, just franchising at the moment. We're, re- we're getting ready to launch our franchise. And I thought, actually, how do I deliver this program to other people who, who, you know, care about kids, who want to be kid champions. How do I do that? And actually, I said, what is resilience? Well, it's future-proofing our kids. Of course it is. And I think a lot of people think that is those children who've been through adversity, you know. And when I say kids, I mean from 3 to 23, you know, literally the whole the whole thing. And What we think is they've gone through trauma or adversity or a hard time and they've they've come through the other side and they've pulled the socks up and they've gotten with it and that's resilience. And actually it's not. Resilience can be built and there's components in resilience that mean that we can build it ahead of that adversity, that life challenge, that trauma that they may struggle with as they grow up. And so looking at things like community, Where is their community around them? Who have they got in their community? And that's one of the things that I first look at with any child, doesn't matter if they're at university, you know, I have quite a few people, um, uni students who live in, used to live in Abu Dhabi, but come to university here. And so they haven't got their mom and dad and siblings all around them. So, okay, who's your community now? Oh, well, I've got my flatmate, who else? You know, because we need more. We are human beings who need connection. So I always look at community. We look at what kind of connections they've got and who are their safe people to go to. And that Mm. doesn't matter if it's in school. That doesn't matter if they have karate after class. You know, have they got people there that they can talk to? You know, not just talk to, but they know that if they were in trouble, that that's their go-to person in that situation. So Mm. things like that, that I think... You know, as we look at all the components, how how does that stack up for our child? And actually, mm-hmm. one of them is around, you know, kind of going back to tech. What I've noticed is that we've got more children inside rather than outside. And because they're not getting that exercise or they're not getting that fresh air, their self-care component of resilience is starting to drop and again it's up to us as parents to teach them about that we know we shouldn't stay up and do an extra netflix if we've got a busy day the next day we know that you know we need to move our bodies a couple of times a week at least we know that getting outside makes us feel better mentally we need to teach that we need to yeah. teach that it's not enough school can't do that You know, so it's things like that, that we can really help build. And I put together like a little um, free quiz where people can go and just check out and they just answer simple questions about their child and it gives you a little score. But what it does is tell you which of the components that your child is kind of lower in and the lower your resilience, the lower your mental health, the lower your physical immunity is. So, you know, If I said to you, 
okay, you, you do this, 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 and this, and your child be resilient, why would you not? Mm, definitely. Yeah. And I suppose when the, all throughout parenthood, you know, the, the smaller our children are, the more we do for them and with them. And gradually we let go and let go until they can do it by themselves. And I suppose that's, it's all part of that. Like they're going to learn through doing and observing until they adopt it as important enough to do without you telling them to. Um, so something like getting outside, let you say, the the benefits of that are so huge. And yet, and again, pandemic didn't help really. We all felt very much hunkered down for a period of time. It was a very unusual time, but yeah, it can sometimes be easier to stay in and and do the easy things. But I suppose there comes a point when a child reaches that age and stage where they're like no no I want to do this for me because I know how good it feels when I do um and they're only gonna they're only gonna even get that feeling good feeling if we show them demonstrate that take them outside do things with them until like holding the bike up until they can do it without the stabilizers kind of scenario (laughs) I think that's really interesting what you say there Lucy because I think sometimes when we're talking about teaching our children things what we don't realize is they don't get on a bike after the first time and just ride we Mm. you know how many times have you told your children to brush their teeth Mm. if you could but if you had a pound for every time you told a child to brush their teeth my god none of us need to work you know and and that's the thing is it's not about and I think sometimes what happens particularly with tech but particularly with things like that like getting out and getting fresh air sometimes it becomes a path of least resistance. And actually what we're doing is robbing our kids of the opportunity to learn and the opportunity Mm. to to future-proof, you know? Mm. So things like, for me, responsibility, teaching your child to be responsible. And I don't mean for siblings. Um, Pets are a really good example of that. Chores are a really good example of that. And I have a bit of a bugbear and I want it when I have um so the kind of way I work sorry is to I'll do say four sessions with a child I'll chat to the teacher I'll chat to the bus driver if I need to whoever's involved with that child but I'll have a parent session which I work my model is very different than say the usual therapists because they don't often work with parents as well they might do family therapy but they don't do kind of sessions with the children and then parent sessions and as a parent myself I think it's really important that they get support so Mm. I I don't share what the children say in the session that is still kept confidential but what I will do is I'll say what are you seeing at home what are you struggling with okay and then I'll give them tips you know so Mm -hmm. working to give the the children strategies or the student strategies but then also the parents separately because I think that's really important because sometimes you know well, I always say, if you've got a manual with your first child, you'd have mm. to put it in the bin for your second, you know, because yeah. they're all different. So it's about working with the child and the parents where they're at. So one mm. of the first things I always ask is, do your children do jobs around the house? And they'll go, oh, that's a really unusual question. And I'll say, is it? Why? And they go, oh, well, you know, sometimes, sometimes they might wash up or sometimes they might, you know, make the bed or whatever. Now, I could give you a long list of chores that my kids can do. And that is because from very young, I have always instilled it in them that we are, this is our house, we all help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it isn't because I think, oh, they can change that bed, I don't need to. Although it is lovely now they're older and they can do that. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's more around because psychologically, when we say we need you to, so I need you to set the table, I need you to tidy your room, I need you to do this, they are needed, they are wanted, there's a place around this table, you belong. Mm. That's what we're saying. When they help out, they belong. Mm. They're not a visitor. You know, mm. if you came to my house, I wouldn't expect you to lift a finger. Mm. Somebody who lives here, who belongs here, mm. helps out. And there's a psychological thing about taking that responsibility for that child and they take mm. responsibility for being part of a family and a team and mm. you know whatever else you want to call it and those who do get on better at university if they go to university 
They work better in a team at work. It's been shown through research. But also as well, I find they get on better with friendships mm-hmm. and, and certainly future relationships because mm-hmm. there's no expectation of you do this, you do that. It's mm-hmm. what do I need to do? You know, mm-hmm. that's the first question. So it not only helps build resilience, but it helps them to feel they belong. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I really like the framing of that. I know sometimes my children will feel like, well, why do I have to do it when you're stood right there? Or <laughs> why do, like, um, they'll they'll do it to my husband. They'll say, like, dad's just sitting there. And I'm and I've got to go and do this and this yet before school, but he's free. So why? And he, my husband's brilliant. He's very um, he's very good at sticking to his guns. I I can be a soft touch, but he's very. And he'll be like, well, be, because that's your role, because that's your your job, and you need to manage your time in order to make sure you can fit your things in. Just because I'm free doesn't mean I have to go and bail you out on your responsibility so and and he's right I just sometimes end up going oh my god we're in a rush just (laughs) but I it that doesn't help though does it because if I swoop in and then do the thing for them then I'm like you say actually I'm robbing them of learning um those responsibilities uh learning time management um and and even like I love that sense of sense of belonging sense of value like you're valued in this home and this is, you know, this is your, this is your part. Um, and can I just say, so there's two things there that you've brought up. I think it's really good. <laughs> well done, Dad, by the way. Uh, for that. <laughs> so, that sense of belonging for me, and it kind of really touches a nerve when I think about this. And this is the reason. I work with a lot of teens and some of them can be very troubled, you know, and you, I mean, when I worked in Abu Dhabi, the affluence i i termed a phrase i did some research on it and it i termed a phrase called affluent neglect so these kids mm. did not want for anything however they didn't have that connection they never had to lift a finger because there was lots of you know maids and nannies around and things like that and if they forgot the you know pee kit a driver would turn up at the school with it and and things so there isn't that sense of connection there isn't that sense of belonging and what happens with teens when they don't feel they belong they look for it elsewhere so where mm. else can you feel that you belong well if somebody's offering you drugs or somebody's offering you alcohol or somebody's offering you do this for me and we've got your back why would you mm. not if you have mm. not got at home they're going to look elsewhere and that's the biggest thing and it's it's heartbreaking because actually you think it's not that hard a thing to instill in your kids and Mm. and actually I think it's because we don't want to think that they have to do the cleaning or they have to tidy up after themselves we don't you know we want them to have a happy easy life and a Mm. lot of my a lot of my parents will say and they'll go, oh, but I don't want the argument or I don't want the battle. And I'll go, yeah, but that's because when they say no, you're giving in. If they know no is no, you don't have a battle as much. Mm-hmm. As if, you know, one thing that I always think about is around, around kind of this kind of thing. I always say to my parents, do you want your kids happy? And they'll go, yeah. I'll go, or do you want them safe? And they'll be like, oh, hold on a minute. Mm. What do you mean? I can't have both. I say, Mm. you can't have both all the time. No, you can have safety all the time. You can't have happy and safe. And Uh. I think that's sometimes when we try and be friends with our kids. Yeah. We let them away with, I don't let them away. I don't even mean that. I mean, just we go, okay, you don't need to do it. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, my daughter has got exams this week. She hasn't. You know, she hasn't made tea. She hasn't emptied the dishwasher. Her brother is moaning. And I'm like, mate, she's got exams. When it's your turn, you don't do anything, you know? So there is a flexibility around it. But I think sometimes as parents, we always want our kids to be happy. And actually, I want mine safe. I'd love for them to be happy and safe all the time. It's not always possible because there's going to be times Mm -hmm. when they want to go to a concert in Liverpool, on the train, on a Saturday night. I'm going to go, absolutely not. 
not happening. <laughs> that is just not happening, girl. You know, and so you can be that's... unhappy about it, but it's uh, yeah, yeah. I have Stop. those kinds of yeah. decisions my at the job, moment, and my yeah. job is to keep you safe. It's not to yeah. make you happy. It is to keep you yeah. safe. Now, don't get me wrong. That is a real life uh, situation yeah. I've just said, described with my daughter. Yeah. And what I said to her was, I can't. I don't, she's, you know, she's in sixth form. She's, she's only 16, but she's, you know, year 12. And she wanted to go to Liverpool to this concert with friends and they were coming home on the train. And I said, if I could pick you up, I don't mind you going on the train because it's early. I said, but I'm not having you come home on the last train from Liverpool. So she going around the houses, wasn't happy at all. I said to her, is he on any other time? This guy you want to go and see in concert? Yeah, he's on the night before in Manchester. Go there. I can pick you up from there. I just couldn't do it that night. I just yeah. couldn't do it that night. None of us were available. So the answer's mm. no. And she sulked. And I let her sulk for the day. Like I let her, I wasn't, you know, whatever, get on. And I said to her the next day, enough now. And she, what do you mean? I said, you're sulking. And I get it. And I get that you're disappointed. And I'm disappointed for you. I wish I could say to you, Go. Have a lovely time. I said, I've given you an alternative. If you don't want to take that, that's your choice. It's not my job to keep you happy. It's my job to keep you safe. Yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, it's um, it's not easy. Well, it can be easy. That's the thing. It can be easy. We don't make it easy on ourselves. And we put all this additional meaning. I think that's the problem. I know I do. And I give it meaning. And, and like you said, the flexibility she has exams you've gone out do you know what she's got things on her mind this week and I think that's really lovely if you've got the norm but then you can have that flexibility because then that also does demonstrate like I've got your back and then you know hopefully they they learn to do that too so we can do things for each other out of kindness and that they also learn acts of kindness and that sort of thing but that with the responsibility there too it's um yeah it is so so important it is. And I talk a lot with families. So sometimes I'll have the whole family around the table and we'll we'll do a family meeting and really air mm. what's going on and, and how we can solve it and stuff. And one of the things I, a concept I talk about is the family pot. And it's like, okay, so dad earns. So, you know, traditionally dad earns, he's put money in the pot and, you know, mum probably working as well. So she's putting money in the pot, but mum's also doing like the washing and the ironing and blah, blah, blah. And um, who's cooking dinner? And also mum's also there when you come home from school and you've had a crappy day, or she's there when you've had a falling out with your friends or, you know, anything like that, or you broke up with a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever. So, okay, so let's have a look. Who's financially putting in the pot? Who's practically putting in the pot by helping out? And who's emotionally putting in the pot? And then have a look, who wants to take out of this pot? <laughs> so all yeah. that we want to take out, of course we do. Of yeah. course we do. So, for instance, if you've got a child that, say, does a lot of extracurricular and they need lots of lifts, okay, well, mm-hmm. what are you putting in the pot for that? What? And you see their face and they're like, <laughs> just because this has always happened doesn't mean, say, it always will. You need to you need to put something back. That means so. For instance, if it was mine, mine goes to acting. One of mine goes to acting school twice a week. It's a bit of a journey, um, and we'll happily do it. However, I'm going to spend two hours in the car. So, what are you putting in for that? Now, I don't time it. I don't go. I've spent two hours in the car for you. Of course, I don't. But what I do is, what are you doing to help around the house? Which means yeah. frees me up so I can come. I can yeah. take. You know, yep. things like don't just go to bed without saying good night to me, you know, because mm. hey, that's what we expect as a family. But also mm-hmm. that's emotionally putting in the pot. Night, mum. Love you. See you in the morning. Awesome. Yeah. That's so important things- to me as well. Yeah, it really is. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I really like that. Like, I think if we all drew a metaphorical pot, we'd be quite um, amazed at how much uh or how much imbalance there is quite often in in families absolutely and um, it was funny because I did it on my podcast I explained the the scenario and then I had Mm. mum contact me and say Ashley I've done this and this is the this is the pot that my uh, youngest who's who's in high school this is what this is how it's worked and I was like amazed come on the podcast tell me all about it and and she did and I said 
how is it how has it worked for you and has there been any unseen benefits and she said honestly she said the boys just get it now they get that I'm not just moaning she said so mm. that really good she said but the most valuable unseen benefit is that now my husband has to do more because he suddenly realized he's financially probably the you know the biggest pot uh, um, contributor yeah he contributes the most that way but actually what he's realized is he sat while everybody's running around after dinner and stuff and so he's now started to get involved and she went thank you I was like I didn't do anything. You did it. So yeah. So stuff like that, it can have really, you know, valuable side effects you weren't expecting. Yeah. I can imagine though, it being a good family exercise to do, just, you should do like a big template and and have stickers that people can put in and, and they could go, right, let's assess our family pot. How's it going? Yeah. I love yeah. that. Really like that concept. Um, oh, amazing stuff. So When it comes to people will be listening to this with really little ones like babies and thinking ahead. I know you and I have got teenagers and I've got a preteen and a teen um, and sort of partway there. But there's still another level to go to. There there always is. But future, you know, the future is the future. We all know that lots of things from childhood come out in our 30s and our 40s and and so on. So teaching our children, thinking about future proofing them. So teaching them responsibility is a massive one, Um, not depriving them of the, you know, the the opportunity to demonstrate their uh, value, their belonging um, and developing skills for the future as well. Anything else that you feel is a big, a, a must know when it comes to future proofing them? I think for particularly for new parents, but when you have got little ones, the biggest thing for me to start it off is, yes, have those connections around you, but more importantly, don't do, don't do anything. Don't do anything that's wrong. Sorry. Don't do stuff for them. Allow them to make mistakes. So for Mm. instance, when they're really tiny, we can't wait for their first word. We can't wait for them to walk. Would we walk would we walk for them instead of watching that first step? Absolutely not. We would not. Why would you take the joy out of that? You know, it's a beautiful phase, isn't it? As they start yeah. to talk around the furniture and things like that. And and so that's a little bit like as they get older. And yes, OK, sometimes we're in a rush and we have to help out or whatever. But the biggest thing for me I see with little ones is when we start to take over and we do things for them because we don't want them hurt. We don't want them unhappy. And actually we're not teaching them that we can do hard things or they can do hard things as, as a human race, our brains are wired to do hard things. So allow them to make mistakes, allow them to fall over, allow them to, you know, get dressed and put the two feet in one leg of a trouser or something like that, you know, and then help them, then help them correct it, you know, but help them correct it rather than us rushing in and doing everything for them. And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's easy, isn't it, to think about it as a, like just dressing themselves or just brushing their own teeth or things like that. A, it doesn't have to be perfect. But what it teaches them is confidence. It gives them yeah. confidence that they can try and they can get it wrong and they can try again. And actually, mm-hmm. sometimes we swoop in and we do it for them because we don't want them to get it wrong or we don't want them upset. And actually, yeah. we're taking away the opportunity for them to build their confidence and obviously then their resilience. But, you know, yeah. that giving them, helping them build their brave, that's how I talk about it when they're younger. Yeah. Really give them an opportunity to help them build their brave. We're then not going to end up with you know, worried or anxious children, they're going to want to do things away from you because they know they can, because you've given that cornerstone. And that is, that in its essence is the cornerstone of resilience. So that's just beautiful. Do you know that I love the way you've talked about this in in general. And then I'm thinking like my brain is going, this is exactly what we say when we talk about sleep, because when it right to, you know, little young babies, when, when baby, yes, babies need help 
to get to sleep. You know, it's not something they just know how to do straight away without some sort of support because they've been in the womb and there've been all these other things that have assisted the onset of sleep. Then you go and put a baby down in a completely still empty flat space in a quiet room and they're like, whoa, what's this? And they don't know what to do. So we, we um, massively advocate, you know, teaching the healthy development of good sleep. Um, so we don't just put them down and expect them to figure it out or to cry until they nod off. That's not, that's not learning, you know, really, that's just kind of disengaging. But that said, we don't do it for them forever. So when we talk to parents with seven year olds that are still cuddling up with them in their bed and fiddling with their hair all, all night long as a comforter, that's a prop for them. And it's because they can't do it by themselves. So they can't go to that sleepover or have that independence because they're relying on something to do it for them. And this is why, you know, if we rock a baby to soothe them, of course we do that, that's instinct. But if we rock them all the way to sleep every single time they stir or, you know, stick a dummy in or milk in every single time they stir in order to put them to sleep, then we're doing it for them to, you know, continually doing it for them to the point that they don't actually start to recognize the sensations of falling to sleep in their body and, and like, go, oh, okay, this, I, you know, this, this is becoming familiar and, oh, look, I am safe. I'm safe. I'm loved. I'm responded to. I'm, all my needs are met. This is okay. And they can't feel that resilience that they can't feel that um that sense of being okay if we don't give them the space to do that so it's supporting them whilst they develop those skills and I you know everything you were just saying there about everything really I'm like this relates exactly to sleep as well and it does because I love your stuff obviously before we um kind of you know, got to know each other a little bit. Yeah. I looked at your stuff. And actually what I like about the the symmetry between our work is it's about building. You know, it's yeah. not just going to be there. It's not, mm. it's not that, oh, this is it. And, and here's your magic fix. And I think we mm. think sometimes when parents come to people like ourselves who, you know, and I always say, you're the expert with your kids. This is my expertise. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's same with you, Lucy. It's around, for me, it's around building that. You know, we as as I said, we can do hard things. As humans, we can do hard things. Sometimes yeah. it is about just getting through that hard bit because parenting is hard. You know, it's the hardest job. I've I've been doing this twenty five years. I've seen thousands and thousands of kids. It's still my kids that push my buttons. You know, <laughs> but so it is that around building, building the skills, and giving them the opportunity to build. Whether it's you know learning to fall asleep or self soothe, you know, mm. or whether it's building confidence or building their brave. I think there's such similarity between it, but I think both of us really kind of passionately believe it. it's a it's a building process. It's not just yeah. an overnight thing. Hundred percent. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, Ashley, thank you so much for coming on the show today, sharing your amazing expertise and your wisdom your experience it's it's so so valuable and I really hope that our listeners I'm sure they've taken away some real golden nuggets today um that they can implement and that's what I love is the things that you can take away and implement into daily life small small changes that you'll start to see big results if there um, is somebody looking to ask you any questions or they'd like to reach out to you or find out more about you, where can people find you, Ashley? Where's the best place for them to connect with you? Um, well, first of all, thank you for asking, Lucy. It's been lovely. It's really Pleasure. lovely to talk to like-minded um, people and, and just knowing that there's other people out there that support parents because, you know, it is the hardest job in the world. Um, mm -hmm. You can find me on Instagram. I've got a Facebook community as well, a free Facebook, which there's lots of resources in there. Or you can email me at ashley at the resilientkid.co.uk. I'll happily, happily um, answer any questions or have a little chat, whatever you need. Amazing. Thank you. Well, we'll put those links all in the show notes as well. So they're nice and handy and accessible for all of our listeners. So Ashley, once again, thank you so, so much for being with us today. You're welcome. Thanks, Lucy. Take care. Thank you.